is Kia. Ever dream of changing your surroundings for something a bit sunnier? With the rise of remote working, that dream is becoming more and more of a reality, with lots more people embracing the digital nomad lifestyle. But what are the financial implications of that? How do you make a life-changing decision like this while sticking to your money goals? To get into all of this, I'm chatting to Claire Rhodes, a freelance writer whose job meant that in 2021, she was able to make the decision to work from abroad. If the way this episode sounds is a little different to usual, it's because you might have guessed, Claire isn't with me today. She's currently on her travels. Not that I'm jealous at all. Claire, thank you for coming on and taking the time out to speak to us. I want to ask you to kick things off. Tell me a little bit more about your story. How did you become and decide to become a digital nomad? I don't think it's particularly dissimilar to what I imagine a lot of digital nomad stories are. I sort of went to university, went straight into sort of an office job straight after that. I've worked as a content writer for B2B tech companies. So I worked at PR agencies uh, in London, content marketing agencies, that sort of thing. And I've been in that space for about seven years now. But over COVID, like a lot of people, we were stuck inside. We were obviously doing a lot of remote working from there anyway. And I think it just encouraged me and a lot of other people to sort of look at our work-life balance. I hadn't done a lot of traveling before. So that was something that I really wanted to go out and just do a bit more of. Do it whilst I was sort of young, fine. The money side of it does come after a little bit. But yeah, not sort of saving up and doing it for retirement and that sort of stuff. So I decided to go freelance in summer 2021, which is when I decided to give up my house that I was renting in Buckinghamshire, sell all my stuff, my car, everything. And me and my partner just upsticked and started traveling basically, yeah. Claire, that sounds like an absolute dream. As someone who loves <laughs> to travel as well, I'm sure you've probably seen some incredible things. And this year I went traveling my, one of my favourite places was Thailand. And nice. I think that was when I realised it's actually not as hard as people think. Obviously, there's time differences, there's things to work out, but yeah. it's relatively easy to work abroad. And I thought it was going to be harder than that. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree. I think unless you are sort of surrounded by people who have done it or know someone who have done it or, and sort of been successful at it, it seems like a very far-fetched idea. But until you actually meet someone who's done it and they can sort of tell you a little bit about it and the fact that there's... Yes, there's hurdles to go over, but it's not, like you said, it's, it's not as hard as I think people make it out to be. It's just a very different way of life that you just have to adapt to, I think. Absolutely. And I'm, it's, it's, glad, it's good that we've got you here to hear about everything that you're doing. So what does life look like for you now? So what work do you do and what does a typical week look like for you? I am living in Bali in Indonesia at the minute. We got a year long lease there. So that's where sort of home is, I guess, at the moment. I'm still doing the same work that I was doing when I was full time employed. So I'm still doing B2B tech content writing, but I've obviously just got my own client base that I work with. I'm really lucky that I've got a lot of flexible clients. The time difference for Bali and UK is like seven hours, sometimes eight hours when we have daylight savings. So it's a little bit brutal. But everyone has been fantastic about having early morning calls in the UK and stuff so that it doesn't kind of, I'm not joining calls at 1am and that kind of thing. But obviously when it needs to happen, that's absolutely fine. In terms of a typical week, it depends if I'm sort of actively travelling or I'm back in my place in Bali. Um, but what I try to sort of only work three days worth of hours a week, if you like. I'm really trying to be kind of strict on that because... One of the reasons I wanted to do, obviously, the whole digital nomad and remote working thing is to go out and see more of things. So it's very easy once you start getting your clients in and getting your money in and stuff to end up being stuck working Monday to Friday. And I think I've just tried to be really, really strict with myself about not going back into that. Needless to say, sometimes you do have to do that. Sometimes where you are living or traveling to is more expensive and flights and accommodation and things add up. And then you need to get more money in and that's fine. But one of the really nice things is if you need to have a month or two where you're living a bit cheaper, you need to sort of not have so many expenses and stuff. You can you can fly somewhere that's going to lend that to you. So Bali's a great example of that. Flights, yes, can be expensive depending on where you are. But the actual cost of living and the quality of living is a lot higher than in other places in the world. Claire, you are really selling this to <laughs> myself and everyone listening. You know, three day work week, get to see the sites. And like you said, if things you need to kind of cut back on money, you'd make that move. You're really selling it. So let's <laughs> let's go into that a bit more. What have some of your high points been then? 
And what has surprised you on your journey of into this digital nomad life? I would say some of my high points is some of the weird and wonderful places I've travelled to. I've been to Mauritania and West Africa. I spent a month in Pakistan. Places that you wouldn't necessarily think to go on on vacation, but because you're travelling, it's kind of it's obviously more of like an interesting place to go to and a far far less travelled if you like. And it was amazing, but also the fact that on either side of that trip, I was just able to kind of just lock in and get my work done and then I could take that month off and it was fine and I knew everything was going to be fine and all my clients knew I was going to be off for a bit and then I could just come back and get straight back into it but yeah I think that's something that I would perhaps elaborate on find find your nice easy clients and make sure that you build a connection with them I think a lot of people are worried with remote work that you it's all kind of email based and you don't really get to know anybody especially as a freelancer I find that people are sometimes a little bit standoffish about that and it's very different to meeting someone in the office and doing that kind of thing but just make sure you have kind of regular phone calls with people and just like have that personal element as well so that you're both seen as human you're not just business entities doing a business transaction I think that's really really important in terms of things that surprised me I would say from a, it's kind of a digital nomad point of view, but also a self-employed point of view, taxes, to be honest. (laughs) Um, When I first went freelance, I didn't earn as much in my first year. I didn't work for kind of six months. I saved up a lot and just wanted to solely travel. So I only worked for the latter six months of it. Whereas my second year was very much traveling and working continuously. I I did my tax bill a couple of months ago and was a little bit surprised by that so I'm having the fun thing of making sure I've got enough money to pay for that in January so I think that's something to bear in mind whether you're digital nomading or kind of doing self-employed that kind of thing just do your homework on where you're working and your tax situation and who you need to pay for what would be a I think a solid piece of advice that I wish I'd taken a little bit more notice of but I've done that now so hopefully the hard work's done for anyone else thinking about it and listening. I think what you mentioned there is really good. I mean, you've managed to do some incredible travels. That sounds like a dream, the places you've been and what you've done. But when it comes to the finance element and you mentioned taxes, we've spoken about it before in this podcast, but that is something that really does almost stump people, especially when you're self-employed. And it's it's great to see that obviously now you've kind of got a bit more understanding. But I think a lot of self-employed people, myself included, have had a similar journey where, you know, you go into it, everything's great. And then the tax bill comes and then you're having to kind of work that one out. And just a reminder for our listeners, make sure that you're checking the tax and employment regulations in the countries that you're planning to travel to, because each country has their own rules and restrictions on this. And it's always good to double check and see what's going on with those countries. It's also worth noting that with national insurance, you may have to pay this if you think that there's any chance you may be returning back to the UK in the future. When it comes to your financial goals then, Claire, how does working abroad actually fit into those goals that you have? I think it it kind of fits in. So, for example, I want to buy a house at some point. I'm 30. I've not quite got there yet. I'm not sort of at the stage in life where I want to get married and have kids and stuff. But yes, I would like to have a house in a few years. And I think sort of working abroad like I mentioned earlier if you are if you have a kind of financial goal like that for a house deposit for example in your mind and you want to do that it's very easy to live where it's a lot cheaper and you can save a lot more money. I think everything that you shared in this episode has been really good at almost dispelling anyone including myself who might have had reservations about moving abroad you know what am I going to do for money where am I going to live it's going to cost so much I think there is that perception that idea that it will cost an arm and a leg when in reality you shared of your journey that you're earning more working less and paying less so you can reach some of your financial goals and Claire you might have had me sold I know that wasn't your aim but you might have had me sold you know don't be surprised if the next episode I'm going to be on a sunny beach somewhere everyone don't be surprised What do you wish you'd known before you made this change? I think there's three things that kind of jump out for me here. The first being just do your homework. So look at where you're going, look at where you want to travel, look at where you want to work and just make sure you have the right things in place to be able to kind of do that properly. So look at things like where you need to pay taxes. So that obviously depends on your clientele and where you're working and look at things like visas as well. You obviously, if you're going somewhere where you're going to work online and you need a business visa, for example, just make sure you've done the right sort of research to make sure that you're ticking all the boxes. The second thing I would say would be to have a safety net. 
Traveling is great, but unexpected things do happen. So expect them to happen um, and just be prepared. So if you need to have a last minute flight home or you need to change your travel plans and that kind of thing, just make sure you've got a bit of money set aside to do that. If you don't, it's going to get very overwhelming very quickly. You don't want to kind of be putting things on your credit card and that it's just it's going to be a lot. So just make sure you've got that sort of capital set aside for that, I think is really important. And thirdly, I would say choose a place where you're going to have a bit of a community. There's some really, really great cities that I've been to that have got really, really, really good sort of digital nomad communities in there. And that's obviously why people go. Off the top of my head, uh, Changu in Bali, which is where I live, is a great example of that. Other places as well, Lisbon, and there was uh, also Tulum in Mexico is another place that I've been to that's got really good digital nomad communities. And I think it's really important to surround yourself with like-minded people, especially if you want to go down the digital nomad route. So a really, really good example of that, there's a, there's a pub where I live in Bali and on a Friday night, everyone goes down there. But it's always really interesting because it's always people who are kind of starting their own businesses, looking for inspiration, where they want to travel to next. You'll probably find someone who is in the same field as you or someone who you would see yourself as having a client in that space and you can end up working together. Everyone's really willing to help each other out and sort of provide that inspiration that you may need at that certain point. And if you're lucky enough that you're in the right place at the right time, you can give inspiration to other people who may need it at the time as well. To round off this episode, I ask every guest the same question. And I'm going to ask you, what three tips do you have in terms of being a digital nomad that will help our listeners get a little bit richer? The first thing I would say is just, just do it. Just give it a go. Don't wait until retirement to do all your travel dreams and that kind of stuff give it a go if it doesn't work it doesn't work if it does it's going to be the best decision you ever make secondly I would say look at what you can actually do feasibly sort of working remotely you need to remember that you're traveling around you've only got so much space in a backpack so picking something that is laptop based is great obviously I'm a content writer I only need a laptop I don't need to have sort of cameras and, and all that kind of stuff that might make it a bit harder perhaps to travel around for some people and thirdly, I would say save up a bit first. When I left to go traveling a few years ago, I sold everything in my house and downsized everything to a couple of boxes that are at my mum's garage now. So that money really helped me. It made me feel a lot more secure. It, moving to another country and traveling around is quite a scary thing to do. So having that money set aside was really nice for me to know that I have it. And if I need to dip into it, I can. And if I don't, great, I can just continue saving. Claire, thank you so much. I'm excited to see where you're off to next. You know, somewhere hot and sunny, I'm sure, compared <laughs> to where I am, Chile, <laughs> UK. But thank you so much. It's been a great episode. Thanks a lot, Kia. It's nice to see you. Great to hear about Claire's incredible lifestyle. The podcast has taken a break for a couple of weeks for Christmas, but then a little bit richer will be back in the new year with a look at how to create good money habits for 2024. In the meantime, if you're enjoying the pod, hit follow and tell your friends. See you in January.